workers came back to work. And we have been through such a fight against the coronavirus. It's been such a difficult time in this city, but we saw yesterday the beginning of the comeback of New York City. Now, we have to be clear, we are not just trying to get people back to work. We are not just trying to return to the status quo that existed before the coronavirus. The coronavirus taught us extraordinarily painful, powerful lessons about disparity, about the lack of equality in this city. So our clear mission is to not just restart, not just recover, but renew this city, to do something very different, to come back as a city that is fair, a city that is just, a city that hears and sees all its people and acts in their interests. We must build a different New York City as we move forward. And that is where the task force for racial inclusion and equity comes in. Leaders of this city government who are doing work here and now I want to be abundantly clear about this. This task force was not named to talk about big ideas that would happen someday. This task force was named specifically of people who are leaders in city government right now, people of color leading city agencies playing a crucial role so that we could do work right now to address disparity. When I named the task force 45 days ago, it was with the goal of doing work that would have a tangible and immediate impact and then working on the bigger vision as well of what we could achieve in the next year and a half and what this city needs to achieve beyond. Already, the work of this task force has led to the decision to shift resources from the NYPD to youth services and social services, it has led to the decision to move the enforcement of street vending away from the NYPD, it's led to the decision to address healthcare issues such as the creation of mobile testing in the hardest hit communities all around this city. But now there is more to do immediately, particularly on the disparities in healthcare, which are so sharp and so real and were the foundation of why the coronavirus did such horrific damage in communities of color. We have to address the underlying reality of Healthcare being a human right, that is not understood still in this nation, but here in New York City it is, and that is why we are guaranteeing healthcare for every New York citizen, every New York person, regardless of documentation status. This COVID crisis has shown how broken our national reality is when it comes to healthcare, how many people suffered for years without access because access was based on money, how many people never got physical healthcare and Lord knows never got mental healthcare. How many people just didn't even have a doctor they could turn to? Well, we made clear with the decision a year and a half ago to move to guaranteed health care for all New Yorkers that we had to lead the way. We had to show that everyone will get health care regardless of income, regardless of whether they have insurance or not, regardless of documentation status. If you are a New Yorker, you deserve health care. And so New York City created NYC Care. And it began in August 2019 in the Bronx continued January this year in Brooklyn and Staten Island. Tens of thousands of people now have their own doctor for the first time, for many, and the first time in their lives, a doctor, a primary care doctor they could turn to, pay only what they could afford. If they could afford nothing, that doctor was still there for them. But the task force looked at the situation and said, even though that was a powerful start, we need to go farther. And the task force called for NYC care to be expanded rapidly in Queens and Manhattan four months ahead of schedule so we could reach 55,000 more New Yorkers, folks of limited means but unlimited potential who need health care. And that means primary care. It means special care. It means surgery, dental care, eye care, women's health, affordable medications. Again, no one charged more than they could pay. That is a foundation, but where we need to go much farther is in the area of mental health because we have seen what happens in a society that does not provide mental health care. I was painfully reminded of it as I joined members of the Cure Violence Movement a week ago at Queensbridge Houses, largest public housing development in New York City. I talked to residents one after another about the pain that they had experienced in the coronavirus crisis, and for so many it was the pain of losing a loved one. It was the pain of not being able to mourn 
It was the, the sense of injustice, and that all added up for so many people to create anxiety and depression, to bear down on them, to create a mental health crisis within the crisis. We need to help make sure that people get the mental health care they need, and the task force on racial inclusion and equity is focused on what we can do right now. And so to talk about the latest initiative from the task force, turn to someone who, and I know I may be a little bit subjective because of my love for her, but she is not only a great leader in this city, a great leader in this nation in calling for mental health care for all and showing it can be done, the First Lady of New York City, Charlene McRae. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Before the pandemic, and I emphasize before the pandemic, a study found that within New York City, serious psychological distress is three times higher among adults who experience racism. And so we were not surprised by the results of the survey the task force sent out to the communities hardest hit by COVID-19. 28% of the residents, of the respondents, said that mental health was their top concern. The tremendous grief and loss, anger around the tragic killings is palpable. And when job insecurity, housing insecurity, worry about the prospects of the children are included, with depression, with the depression that so often accompanies living with a chronic disease, it is a wonder how anyone manages such an emotional burden. Langston Hughes asked that question 70 years ago in 1951 when he asked, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over? like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? The accelerated expansion of NYC care provides another opportunity for people to connect to mental health services directly or when they seek to address other health concerns. We are also turbocharging the mental health resources in the community's hardest hit by the pandemic, working with 270 community faith-based organizations. By the end of this year, we will reach 10,000 more residents with mental health supports that include education and information about resources and coping strategies. We will also train trainers, and that's clergy and community-based organization representatives. Uh, these folks will, who already have the trust of the communities and the ability to care for others right there in the neighborhoods where people live. People should have culturally competent care and different ways to access support for themselves and their loved ones. Cost should not be a barrier. There should be no stigma and especially no wrong door when help is needed. These actions are a significant step in the direction that we want to go in uh, these next weeks, and uh, we, you'll be hearing more from us coming very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our First Lady, to all the members of the task force. They are working constantly, and I mean constantly. And as the First Lady said, when the task force recognizes something needs to be done right now, it will be done right now and announced by the task force leadership and then put into action by the city of New York. Now, I also want to talk about something that needs to happen right away and it emerged from powerful, moving, thoughtful conversation on Sunday at Gracie Mansion. It is important when people are struggling and fighting for change and justice, it's important that not only are their voices heard, but they're heard in full. That people who truly represent communities from which they come, the fights for justice that have pervaded for years, that they bring forward the pain, the anger, the frustration, but the solutions 
the things that we can do differently, the things we must do differently, and that's what happened Sunday at Gracie Mansion. Conversation that everyone involved thought should be different, should be something done truly mutually, not about photo ops, not about something superficial, but something essential. So we spoke for quite a long time about just how much pain there is, about just how many challenges people feel in their everyday life, how much racism affects every moment of every day, and particularly policing. We talked about the culture of policing that has to change. We talked about how pervasive the problems were, but it was not a hopeless conversation. In the end, a hopeful conversation because the leaders and activists who gathered believed that change could happen and had specific ideas for change. And they put them before the First Lady and I, and they said, these are the things that would matter, and we will start working on them one by one. I want to thank all of these leaders, all but one of whom are here today gathered with us, and one of whom will speak on behalf of the group. But I want to acknowledge and thank each and every one of them. Reverend Kevin McCall, civil rights activist, born and raised in Brownsville, has dedicated his life to fighting for equality. He is a former crisis director at the National Action Network, and he organized a very powerful, heartfelt memorial for George Floyd at Cabin Plaza a few days ago, at which George's brother Terrence was present. Mike Tucker. Mike Tucker lost his own son to police violence, became one of the city's real, true, authentic leaders against gun violence, founded Lay Down, excuse me, Lay the Guns Down, the organization Lay the Guns Down, and has done extraordinary work to try and create progress and healing and a different reality in our streets. Anthony Beckford, president and co-founder of Brooklyn Chapter of Black Lives Matter, served in the United States Marine Corps, came back to his community, devoted to change, has emerged as a powerful voice of justice, a leader organizing the peaceful protests for change that have made such an impact on this city. Aisha Sekou, who will speak for the group of activists gathered. Aisha is the CEO of Street Corner Resources, a leading cure violence organization, does extraordinary work engaging young people helping them to reach their amazing potential, helping to protect them. And I've had many opportunities to talk to Aisha and see her work over the years. I have tremendous admiration for her. And one of the things I said during our State of the City address really was based on the work of Aisha and her colleagues who have done amazing, amazing, just beautiful work to nurture our young people. I said in that speech, our kids don't need to be policed, they need to be reached. And Aisha and so many other good people in cure violence and community-based organizations are reaching our young people in a positive way. Gwen Carr was at our meeting at Gracie Mansion, the mother of Eric Garner, one of the most prominent voices for justice in this city and in this nation, a conscience who has turned pain into purpose if ever that phrase has been made real and human. It's in the person of Gwen Carr, someone I admire, someone I feel shows the best in all of us. Gwen is in Houston today as part of one of the recognitions of the life of George Floyd. Here representing her is Bishop Evans, cousin of Eric Gardner. And Bishop, we thank you for joining us in this important moment. So before I turn to Aisha, I will simply recount the one crucial piece of the conversation at Gracie Mansion Sunday. The activist said, it's time to do something officially representing this city to recognize the power of the fundamental idea of Black Lives Matter, the idea that so much of American history has wrongly renounced but now must be affirmed. And the proposal put on the table was to name streets in each borough and to paint the words on the streets of this city. In each borough, at a crucial location, one of which will be here near City Hall, and I want to thank 
Borough President Gail Brewer and Councilmember Margaret Chin who are working with us on this effort. And we're going to work with these leaders and advocates and, of course, the City Council to find the other four locations. But what will be clear, the street name and on the streets of our city is that message that now this city must fully, fully, deeply feel, and this nation must as well, that black lives matter. And with that, I turn to Aisha Sekou. Thank, thank you, Mayor Bill de Blasio. It is um, a great pleasure and honor to be able to have voice along with other uh, leaders here and to be able to be in conversation uh, with you and to look at uh, ways to make this city better and greater. But I stand here thinking about Mike Tucker and Katiatu Diallo and Gwen Carr, Nicole Bell, Deron Smalls, and all of the others who lost their loved ones to police violence. I have to say that they are in support of the street renaming and that there are good vibrations coming from that. But I would be remiss if I stood here and didn't talk about those mothers and grandmothers like myself. I have a 23-year-old grandson when he comes to New York and the fear I have with him engaging, about him engaging uh, the police. It's, I'm nervous until he gets back in the house. My conversations with other mothers and grandmothers are basically the same. They're giving their children, uh, these young men and women, uh, a way to have to be because our police have a way that they are. So I'm glad that we're in conversation about actions that need to be taken, about the consequences for wrong police behavior, abusive and brutal police behavior has to match consequences. That behavior is not within police policy. We cannot make it okay. I think as a city in our past, it just became part of what happens. Another black kid was killed today. Well, that we don't want to see that. We don't want to have to, to name a street, but I'm glad that we are. But we also want to make sure that police are not allowed to act in the way that we've been seeing. And so I'm grateful, again, for the conversations that we're having. I'm looking forward to those conversations turning into action. We're looking very much forward to, and that's our community at large, to holding the police, again, accountable for their behavior. I'm grateful that we are looking at the illegal chokehold and not just looking at it, but taking action on it to ban it, to ban it. It should not exist. I also have to say that we are looking forward to continued conversation overall. We're re really, really proud that uh, Cure Violence has been a major part in this city, helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19. I have to give a shout out to Street Corner Resources, the Speak Peace Forward team, and all of the crisis management uh, system in the Office to Prevent Gun Violence. So again, thank you for having me here. I'm really looking forward to eradicating this police brutality and violence that we see in this city. So thank you again. Thank you, Sherlyn, for all of your hard work, and I appreciate you both. Thank you, Aisha. And I want to just amend, uh, amen the point about the crisis management system and cure violence, which has been a hugely important movement in this city, that this city government has supported more and more each year with more and more resources, and we've seen more and more impact of community leaders from the grassroots, folks who stop violence before it even begins, folks who create community leadership to solve community problems. Now, Aisha, you've been one of the true leaders of that movement, and uh, it is proving every day that there's a better way. I want to thank you, and we have more we're going to do together. And I'll conclude this section by saying to all of the activists, thank you. God bless you for the work you do. We're going to keep talking. We're going to keep meeting. It doesn't mean everyone always agrees, but that doesn't, to me, stop there from being powerful, meaningful dialogue that leads to change. One thing we have all agreed on is the only change to discuss is change that can happen now. That's right. Deeds, not words. And so we will continue in that spirit meeting and finding the next step and the next step and the next step and helping this city to move forward. I know all the activists have a lot to do today. Uh, so they're, they're going forward with their work today. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for you. having joined us. And we will continue in this work together. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.
Let me continue with some other important updates. Yesterday, I got a call from the mayor of Houston, Texas, Sylvester Turner, who is an extraordinary public servant who's dealt with amazing, painful challenges in his city, amazingly difficult time in his city, not just now, but in the years before. And uh, Houston is the hometown of George Floyd. Mayor Turner asked me, could we light our city hall in remembrance of George Floyd? And he specifically asked us to light it with the colors of George's high school football team. And we did that last night at City Hall, a small gesture, but an important one in solidarity with the Floyd family, with the people of Houston, with all of those fighting right now for justice. Now, it is a reminder that so many people right now are looking for the real, tangible, meaningful things that we can do to change what's broken. I am so heartened by the changes that I see happening immediately, and I want to thank our legislators in Albany who are doing extraordinary work. I spoke to uh, Speaker Carl Hasty and Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins over the weekend. The package of they reform, the reforms that they have put together in Albany are profoundly important for the future of this city, this state, this nation. Particularly the reforms of the 50A law that have held back transparency, the, the law that has for years stood in the way of transparency, the reforms that are needed to fix it. For so many years, including as recently as February when I testified in Albany, I have been calling for this law to be either changed or repealed, replaced, whatever way you look at it, to get rid of a broken law that was standing in the way of transparency and harming the relationship between police and community. That is finally happening after years and years and years. That is finally happening. And that means we're going to be able to restore trust by showing very transparently what's happening in the discipline process of the NYPD. And the actions that we have taken in this city, based on the work of the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, shifting funding from the NYPD to youth services, that will be formalized in the next few weeks in the city budget. The move to take away vendor enforcement, street vendor enforcement from NYPD, that will be acted on immediately. And we'll look at other ways to put civilians forward wherever possible, a way that improves the level of peace and understanding in this community while keeping people safe at the same time. And then the community ambassadors we discussed just a few days ago, we hired within the NYPD to bring the voices of communities forward to create more of a flow of both information and insight and a better ways of doing things that need to be heard deeply within the NYPD. Those are just beginnings. There is so much more to do, and our city council is doing some very, very important work now. I have had a discussion with the Black Latino Asian Caucus of the city council. I want to thank them for their leadership over these last weeks. And I'm going to be speaking with them again to talk about all the steps we need to take, some of which are legislative, some of which are administrative, some of which are in our budget. But this is going to be an ongoing process of change. It's going to be a part of a year and a half of relentless effort and change. Today, the City Council is hearing four bills, a chokehold ban for the NYPD, a bill that will affirm every individual's right to record their interactions with police officers, a bill to ensure that all police shield numbers and rank designations are visible to members of the public, and a bill to ensure there will be early intervention on any officers who need more training, or more monitoring, anything that will adjust the course of their career to make sure that it reflects the values of this city. I want to affirm that I broadly support all of these bills. There are some specific details being worked through, but I'm confident that we will work them through and we'll be able to move forward together with the City Council on all four of these bills. Finally, everything that we're dealing with is against the backdrop of this battle against the coronavirus. The pain that people are feeling is not only about the injustices that have been pervading relationship between police and community, the, the reality of structural racism in this country, the reality of an economy 
that was fundamentally based on income inequality, all of that existed before the coronavirus, and then the coronavirus took such a horrible toll on communities of color. One injustice piled upon the next, and the frustration is so deep. And when Sherlane invoked the poem from Langston Hughes, it captured this moment as well, this moment of pain upon pain upon pain. We have so much to do, but remember, we have to do it while fighting back the coronavirus to save lives in all communities, but also to take away that which has created so much additional injustice and start the framework for that fair recovery that we must have in the city. So fighting the coronavirus in every way possible is essential to doing the work of justice. Right now, we saw an extraordinary moment restarting yesterday and the emergence of our test and trace core on a scale never before seen in the United States of America. Now thousands of tracers out there right this moment talking to the people in New York City, making sure that anyone who tests positive is followed up on their contacts or traced. Those people get the support they need. Those people get the testing they need. If they need to safely separate from others, all the support is there. This is going to change the trajectory of the coronavirus in New York City. But every single day, we're going to watch what happens with this disease. We're going to see if our efforts are working. We're going to need every New Yorker to be a part of it if we're going to fight it back. I'm going to keep reminding you, it all comes down to you. Stick to the strength and the discipline, the teamwork, the sense of concern for yourself, your families, but for the whole community that all New Yorkers have shown. So let's talk about the indicators and thresholds today. Number one, the daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID-19. That threshold is 200, and today we are well within that threshold at 52 patients. Second, the daily number of people in health and hospitals, ICUs, that threshold is 375. We're well within that threshold again today at 337. And this last one is unbelievably good news, and it doesn't mean it's always going to be like this, and it doesn't mean we don't need to keep fighting, because we do. But I am so proud of New Yorkers. You have earned this one. The percentage of people tested citywide who are positive for COVID-19, as more and more and more testing, well over 30,000 tests a day, now happening in New York City. That threshold is 15 percent for the first time since the beginning of this crisis. Today's report, only 1 percent only 1% of those tested, tested positive for COVID-19. That is an amazing statement on what all of you have achieved, all of you have done. Let's keep clinging to that progress. Let's build upon it. Let's beat back this disease. Everybody work together. Work with the Test and Trace Corps. Work with your neighbors. Every time you keep that face mask on, every time you stay home when you can. Every time you practice social distancing, you're beating back this disease. But look at that, 1% only. An extraordinary day for New York City. A few words in Spanish. Hasta en el reinicio. Tenemos que abordar las injusticias que esta crisis ha mostrado a nuestras comunidades más afectadas, les vamos a dar aún más recursos para, para cuidar su salud y salud mental. Nuestra misión es esta. Vamos a usar este momento para crear una ciudad aún mejor y más justa. With that, we will turn to questions from the media in our new format that we will discuss. And again, remember to give me the name and outlet of each journalist. Hi, all. Just a reminder, we have First Lady McRae here in person and Deputy Mayor Thompson, Deputy Mayor Bean, Deputy Mayor Priya Hense, and Executive Director of the Task Force on Racial Inclusion, Inclusion and Equity, Bonilla, on the phone. I also wanted to remind you that when called on, you'll have the chance to either ask one question and a follow-up, or one question and then, after it's answered, a second question. In the interest of time, we will still limit each reporter to two questions, uh, but it's up to you whether your second is a follow-up on your first or a new question altogether. With that, I will start with Rich from WCBS 880. 
Mr. Mitch. Mayor, hello. There you go. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, do you think that uh, all of this talk about defunding the police uh, is undermining the average cop's uh, uh, outlook on his job? I mean, this is a, a tough thing to hear, I think, if you're a police officer. Rich, I, it's a very fair question, but I don't think these things have to be a contradiction at all. Um, for years and years in this city, we have been building neighborhood policing. The idea is to bond our police and our communities. The idea is to respect everyone. And in fact, what I have heard from NCOs and uh, cops involved in neighborhood policing is they really prefer having that human relationship, that connection to the community they serve, not to feel like there's distance, but they want to have that human reality, we're all in this together, and that was impossible. When things like stop and frisk existed in this city, you couldn't have that. When there was a policy of over-arrest, you couldn't have that. But now, and I've heard it from officers, I've heard it from community members, now you have a reality that's starting, only starting, Rich, but we have to build upon, where officers can have the true fulfillment of knowing that they are at one with the communities they serve, protecting the peace, Stopping crime, of course, but also connected deeply to community. So we have to do that work. That is the truest work. The retraining of officers, the respecting professionalism by giving training. All of that work matters. Saying that we need to take money from a police department and give it to youth services and social services because we have desperate needs that must be addressed because our young people must be uplifted, that is not an affront. That is an affirmation of the young people and the communities that need help. And Commissioner Shea powerfully said that if there was any place he would ever want to see money go, if he had to lose money from his budget, he said, if, it ha if I had to lose it, I wanted to go to young people. He said that publicly, and, and it is absolutely consistent with what he, say, he said months ago in terms of redefining the mission of the NYPD to focus proactively and positively on young people. So, Rich, I, I don't think it has to be something that people would feel upset about or worried about, I think it could be something affirmational about the way we're going to move forward together. Now, Rich, what do you want to do next? Uh, I'll, I'll ask a different question uh, then. Um, so is anybody in the administration actually laying out plans for what happens if, you, if Washington and Albany don't come through? In other words, you actually, do you have a blueprint? Do you have uh, an idea of, of what kind of cuts would happen? Yes. Um, only... Rich, I, I'm not lying to you if I say when we think about the, the dangers we face, it's very hard to look at them because we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. And um, it is a very real scenario right now. Uh, the last we're hearing, the Senate, the U.S. Senate does not intend to take up the stimulus in the month of June. We must legally have our budget by June 30. Um, we're still in discussions with Albany. I do believe we will eventually get there on borrowing, but we're not there yet. If neither of those things is ready in time, we will see, unfortunately, and I feel very pained to say it, but we will see cutbacks across all city agencies. And um, it's not something we want to do, and we're trying to figure out now how that would be grappled with. We're obviously in conversations with the city council on, on it as well. So um, that is becoming tragically, I mean it truly tragically, because a lot of people will suffer if there aren't resources available or if people are not able to continue their employment in the middle of this horrible economic crisis. I don't know why, Rich, the Senate, after watching the coronavirus and then now watching the, the problems that have been dredged up so powerfully in the last week or two in America, I don't know how they choose to not act. You would think the stimulus would be the most sensible thing now more than ever, but what we're hearing is they won't act. We'll try and do something to fix that. But yeah, we are preparing those plans and, and you know, we're gonna have to come to grips with them very quickly. We have only three weeks till the budget and it will be a very, very tough scenario if we have to do it. Next we have Juliet from 1010 Winds. Oh, hi, uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor, good morning all. Uh, so my question is this, uh, Shootings in New York City have doubled in the past month, and according to uh, Chief of Department Terrence Monaghan, he says gun arrests have occurred, the most, most gun arrests have occurred in Brooklyn. 78% of those arrested have been released on their own recognizance. And 
there were seven shootings in Brooklyn last night. Uh, so what do you think about that? And what is the plan to curb gun violence? Yeah, Juliet, we are going through an extraordinarily difficult time where all of the pieces, you know, all these things simultaneously, the massive health care crisis, massive economic crisis, uh, the human crisis that we're going through, the, the crisis over justice, and on top of that, a, a budget crisis like we've never seen. All of these things are happening at once. This is a, arguably the toughest moment New York City has gone through in its history. But it's also a city that can handle, I think, anything. I think that's the people of New York City that we are willing and able to take on any challenge. So we're going to have to find a way to address this uptick in violence. And I'd say it's a couple of things. It's deepening neighborhood policing, which clearly worked. It is uh, pinpointing where we're seeing the problems, which is the story of Comstat, and clearly worked. When the NYPD, there's been times throughout this administration, every administration, where we saw upticks, NYPD focused strategically on those areas and was able to address the problem. We need cooperation from prosecutors when it comes to gun violence. We need more cooperation from prosecutors to address gun violence. We need our criminal justice system to restart. We all understand why the court system has been largely out of commission because of coronavirus. Hopefully that's going to change now. Uh, we're going to be able to do things as the city comes back to life to create more action in terms of the criminal justice system. We're going to need all of that, Juliet. Juliet? I do have a second, yeah, sort of related uh, question. Um, do you see community leadership and activists playing a bigger role in or with the police department? And if so, to what extent? Yes. Juliet, we have tried now for over six years to try and deepen the role of community engagement with the police, whether it's traditional methodologies like police precinct councils, which do really important grassroots work, whether it is the work of the Cure Violence Movement, which is a different uh, approach, but one where there's still dialogue, uh, whether it is listening to activists who have called for change and reform and all the things that we have done. Way back, it's the end of stop and frisk, but think of everything else over the years, the reduction in arrests, 180,000 fewer arrests in 2019 than in 2013, the reduction in incarceration, 11,000 people in Rikers the day I came in the door in our correction system. 4,000 today. Uh, many, many reforms and changes that came from the voices of communities, we have to deepen that. What I talked about with the activists that Sherlane and I met with Sunday is a series of additional changes we have to make. And so, yes, the NYPD needs to listen. City Hall needs to listen. I need to listen. We need to keep going farther. And I think we can in a way that supports the safety of the people of this city because there is a right way to police, and there is a right way to make sure we work with the grassroots. The truest safety comes from the grassroots, and that's what those voices are calling for, and that's what we can achieve. Next, we have Andrew from NBC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the call. Hope you're doing well. Yes, Andrew, how are you? Good. Uh, I hate to channel Katie Honan here, my good friend, but I do want to ask about the summer. Today could hit 90 degrees, it's possible in the afternoon. I'm wondering what progress you've made towards coming up with any plan to allow young people to either swim in a pool, swim at a beach, or get in a sprinkler. So a very important question, Andrew. And you're channeling an important question from Katie. The, we've got to start with the things we know we can do. So we talked about before the additional sprinklers that we're going to set up in parks that even under the current conditions of phase one, we can do in a safe and appropriate manner. Uh, so there will be cooling for young people, cooling for older people that we talked about before the actions were taken with the air conditioners and cooling stations. But you raise a very important point about the, the beaches, the pools. We're now going to be reassessing everything. We're making some real progress. And, and I want to emphasize, Andrew, we've had to with the coronavirus. No two days have been the same, to say the least. We've had to always guard against the possibility that coronavirus was not being beaten back. Remember that period of time, and I'm knocking on wood as I say it, where we thought we might be in a plateau where it was just going to stay at a high level and not change. Obviously, before that, we thought it was going to keep going upward. 
Thank God, through everyone's effort, it has gone lower and lower, but we have to make sure it stays lower. If we can do that, then we're having a real conversation about beaches for sure. If we can do that, there may even be a way uh, to get back to pools. We're not there yet, and I'm gonna keep saying to people, I understand the, the great anxiety to get there, but we have to make sure that we don't do the worst of all things, which is to allow a resurgence. If we had a resurgence the wrong way, then we're literally shutting down phase one and going back to fuller restrictions or worse. So it's gonna take a little patience, but absolutely we can have a conversation now uh, with a little more opportunity to envision progress around beaches, and now we can start a conversation around pools. I don't know if we'll get there, but at least we can at least begin that conversation now for the first time based on what you saw today with those indicators. Do you want it? Do you have a second one? My second question has to do with uh, outdoor dining and phase two in New York. You had indicated it would be the beginning of July. All the other regions have been able to move to phase two in two weeks, which would put New York City on June 22nd. Why could you not do and how close are you to giving restaurants the details about how they can reclaim some of the street space? Yeah, so two parts to that answer. Uh, absolutely. Is it, is it, if you will, legally possible that we could get to phase two by the end of June? Yes. We need to provide those answers on that timeline. So that means over the next week or 10 days, we have to fill in as many of those blanks as humanly possible. Uh, but I've been very clear, and I said it yesterday, that I'm not saying June 22nd, which is the earliest you know, official date according to state guidance, because I do not want to unduly raise expectations. We are not like the other regions of state. I love the whole state of New York. I've been all over the state of New York. We are different, and we're different in almost every place in the country. That's why we were the epicenter, uh, just the nature of life in the nation's largest city. Uh, so I'm not people, I, I want people to hear that, and we'll work with the state. We're gonna constantly communicate with the state, Andrew, but if we're ready on June 22nd, that's beautiful, but I don't want people to have undue expectations. We're trying to do something so difficult in these next few weeks, bring back hundreds of thousands of workers, and ensure that we keep the coronavirus down, and then bring back many hundreds of thousands more. So I said July because I wanted to keep expectations a little lower, but if we can get there sooner, of course. If the state and the city agree and we think it's safe, of course. Uh, so, yes, in answer to your question, we owe those restaurants guidance very quickly this week, next week. Next, we have Shant from the Daily News. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, to start with, I wanted to ask about the number of letters and even a march with your own staffers recently criticizing your handling of the protests and making demands such as majorly defunding the NYPD and immediately firing officers who used excessive force. Are you planning any action specifically to meet staffers' demands or to otherwise assure them they should continue to work for you? And um, yeah, if we could start with that and then I'll, I'll ask my follow-up. Shant, uh, look, I worked in City Hall as a staffer in an administration dedicated to change in an extraordinarily difficult time in the city's history. Uh, I respect the heartfelt views of the members of this team. I, I know they are speaking from you know, their own honest uh, view of things. And, and I respect everyone's choice. If people don't want to work in this administration, I respect that. Uh, we're gonna continue the work, whether they choose to be a part of it or not. We're gonna continue work. I hear people's voices, but I also understand that there was an election that determined a direction I put forward a vision, we are acting on that vision, we're gonna deepen that vision. That's what democracy is all about. And I've been very clear about the changes we're gonna make. And so people should understand, you know someone by what they have done. When we got rid of stop and frisk, when we settled the Central Park Five case, when we reduced arrest, we ended marijuana arrests, we put body cameras on every patrol officer, we retrained the entire police force in de-escalation, we created dynamic for a police force that's now majority people of color, more and more women officers, more and more officers who are from the city of New York. We brought forward a whole new generation of leadership, including more and more people of color and women in leadership. This is just some of what we have done 
to change the NYPD, all in the rubric of neighborhood policing, which is a profound redirection for this agency. And now we're going to do a lot more, and we are going to relentlessly change this city and this police department over the next 18 months. And anyone who wants to be part of that mission, that's where we're going. Yeah, so I think on a related note, wanted to ask about a uh, high-profile departure that Politico reported this morning saying that Allison, Allison Hirsch is leaving City Hall and going to DOE over objections of your, of your handling of the protest. So I just wanted to ask, between that and, you know, some staffers public, publicly criticizing you, I think even people who don't necessarily follow the inner workings of your administration have to be wondering, is it imploding? Um, not, could you address that? Shant, I appreciate your attempt at drama, but it's just inaccurate. Uh, I have tremendous respect for Allison. She cares deeply about the issues of education. She's been focused on those issues in her previous role. A lot of what she did focused on those issues. She happens to be a working mom who cares deeply about the reality of kids and public school parents and everything they're going through. We're asking her to take on a role, which we actually talked about uh, with her to begin with, it was, might have been her original role, and now is a role that makes sense in terms of the crucial need to bring back the New York City public schools. The hardest mission our public school system has ever gone on will be coming back in September, and it has to be literally the greatest school year in the history of New York City. So it's all hands on deck, uh, and I think she will contribute greatly to that mission. Next, we have Henry from Bloomberg. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? Hey, Henry. How are you doing? Okay. I, I just have one question. I was speaking with someone in the health department, and they said that when people come in admitted to hospitals with suspected COVID, they're not sure because they're untested uh, at that point, there's no contact tracing uh, of these people. In other words, they're treated at the hospital, they're tested, they're uh, but there's no uh, examination of who they may have been close to. So in the hours or days that it takes to get a test result, uh, these people out in the world who they've had contact with uh, presumably are infected or in the process of becoming infected, and they're not uh, located. Nobody knows who they are. They're spreading the virus. Why aren't people who are admitted to hospitals immediately in touch with contact tracers. Yeah. Henry, I, would, I don't know who you spoke to, but that is not the approach. Uh, if there's something that's being missed, we'll fix it immediately. I'll make sure you talk today to either uh, Dr. Mitch Katz or Dr. Ted Long. Uh, contact tracing is for everyone who tests positive in New York City, regardless of where they test positive. If someone comes to the hospital and they're not yet identified as COVID, because it, as we know, some of the folks who are coming in with uh, respiratory symptoms may not be COVID. But anyone who tests positive for COVID, every single one of them gets contact tracing. Uh, if there's any piece that needs to be tightened up, it'll be tightened up. So we'll make sure you get that follow-up discussion. I'm not sure you understood my question. Try again. I people thought I did, but try into, again. People come into the hospital, they're suspected COVID patients. They've got these symptoms. They have not been tested yet. The test results are not in, but they're suspected of having COVID to the point where they've been hospitalized. Their contacts are not traced until a positive test result is obtained. This is coming from the press office of the health department. I do, th Henry, thank you. I think when, when you said your question, I heard the test result piece and I appreciate your clarity. I would use the word symptomatic just so we're all speaking the same language. Uh, I think I hear you now saying if someone was symptomatic but not confirmed, would they be followed up on? Yes, because remember, we need to go after symptomatic people too to the maximum extent possible. Now, I want to affirm to you that we've got so many positive, confirmed positives that the Test and Trace Corps is reaching out to right now that by definition is job one, because we know a certain number of the folks going into hospitals do not have COVID. That is a fact. It has been traced. We should show you that information because it's important. It came up in an earlier question uh, that was a very good one. I think Matt asked it about the, the difference between someone who goes into hospital COVID suspected versus how many are actually confirmed COVID. So tomorrow, I want to speak about that in uh, 
the briefing, people should realize that, thank God, a certain number of those folks who are going in turn out not to have COVID. That's a very good thing, and we need to affirm that. But your point about symptomatic folks is well taken. The test and trace score should, uh, has to first go after the positive confirmed positives, but where there are symptomatic people, it makes sense to start that work as well, presuming there are resources available as we more, move more and more people into test and trace. Uh, we're at thousands of people now, we're gonna keep growing it. I wanna see us reach more and more into symptomatic folks as well. So we will do that follow up with you so you get the specifics, but your point is well taken so long as, you can also hear my point that Job one is where you have a confirmed positive because you know it, and a lot of those folks who are COVID suspect in the hospital turn out not to have COVID. Next, we have Jake from Gothamist. Good morning. Good morning, Jake. Hi. Uh, so yesterday, we, we published multiple videos of police officers violently detaining legal observers with the National Lawyers Guild during Thursday's protest in Mont Haven. When we asked PD about this yesterday, we were told the cops were enforcing curfew, uh, despite the fact that your own office said legal observers were exempt from the curfew. Uh, when one legal observer tried to show officers documentation of that exemption, an officer crumpled the paper to the ground and uh, tossed the woman to the street. There's another video that shows an officer with the NYPD Legal Bureau telling cops that legal observers can be arrested. So my first question is whether you think the officers involved um, in these stops on Thursday should, should face discipline. Well, Jake, it's a very important question. I do not believe ever that a legal observer should be arrested, uh, period. If it's a legitimate legal observer, there is no way they should ever be arrested unless they are committing a specific crime. And obviously the same goes for members of the media. We talked about that the other day. Uh, I will not accept that from the NYPD. If they are in any way violating those very essential rules of a free society that media and legal observers, certified legal observers, certified media, and, and Jake, not everyone, of course, who claims to be something is something, but as you're saying, if someone's showing their documentation, that needs to be honored. Uh, so we need to fix that immediately. In terms of what kind of discipline, the question I would have is, is there, is discipline applied to an individual officer or the person who gave the orders? And we need to look at that specifically, but that should be a part of the investigation of what happened in Mott Haven. I am convinced that there was a profound danger that day. That doesn't mean that everything was done right. Uh, there is a full investigation going on right now by the state attorney general, by the independent review that our DOI commissioner and corp counsel are doing, and of course by Internal Affairs Bureau. I want the truth of what happened in Mott Haven. I believe, based on all the information I received the, in the afternoon before the protest and during the protest, that there was a real and tangible and very dangerous threat of violence in that situation that affected the whole approach. But that does not mean we don't need to look at everything that happened and see if there was anything done inappropriately and there needs to be any accountability for any officer or supervisor. That needs to be part of that review and it needs to happen quickly. Right. So, so my follow-up question um, related to that is that, you know, when we first asked about this on Friday, Dermot Shea said this operation was executed nearly flawlessly. He claimed that uh, police found a gun on protesters and gasoline. Uh, yesterday, I believe the Post reported that the gun was seized hours before the protest at a separate location. Uh, with no apparent link to protesters. There was no gasoline found at the site, as far as we know. Um, are you concerned your police commissioner is spreading misinformation about protesters? I believe he was responding to everything he knew in an incredibly dynamic and um, complex situation. I, I can understand everything we're talking about here, Jake. I know you personally were there. I know it was a painful reality for you, and I respect that. The problem during the whole sequence, those nine or 10 days, was that violence was introduced into our protests in a way we had not seen in this city in such a sustained pattern. We need to find out who did that violence. We need to find out if it was groups from Antifa, if it was right-wing groups, pr pr pretending to be Antifa, whatever it was, if it was just individuals. But that violence 
caused a whole different reality in this city on top of the very different and also unacceptable violence on Sunday and Monday night at the beginning of the uh, protests. The, the violence in the Bronx, the violence in Midtown had nothing to do with the protests, but it added another element that had to be addressed. When we are able now to review everything in the cool light of day, I think what we're going to see is a particular challenge the city never faced in combination on this scale ever. And what was most important was to save lives and, and ensure that no one lost their life, whether a civilian or police officer. But now we have to do the work of understanding exactly what happened, what was done right, what was done wrong, what should be the consequences, what policy should be changed, what accountability needs to be held. But that specific moment, Commissioner showed me what the NYPD had received earlier that day, that afternoon, the threat to that area, the threat of violence coming from an organization that had done violence before. Those items that were seized were seized in the immediate area. Those are real things, Jake. That, that does affect the thinking of those charged with keeping us safe. It's very hard to see all those indicators at once and not believe that something very dangerous is about to happen and not have to take action to make sure that no one is killed. So uh, I believe that's what was motivating the commissioner, but there will be a full investigation. Next, we have Steve from Westwood One News. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. I want to make sure you can hear me well before I start my question. Yeah, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Um, I'll start with one about contact tracing. You know, we're still seeing a significant, definitely a lower number, but a significant number of new coronavirus cases each day. And uh, presumably some of those new cases are the result of the contact tracers responding to new positive cases and going out mapping the contacts, getting those people tested. At some point, that contact tracing effort would, in theory, bring down the daily number of new coronavirus cases to such a low number that you'd consider it successful and, and it's safe to go back to full normalcy. Uh, what figure would the city have to get down to in order to declare that we've reached a low transmission rate and say that the program has worked? And by what date would you like to see the city getting there? Well, Steve, you're asking the big, big question. I appreciate that question. We're talking all the time about that very question, trying to figure out how we define that. Um, you're right that the number of cases is so much lower, but we're still talking about hundreds per day. If each case leads to three, four, five, ten people that then need to be followed up on who are the close contacts with the person who tested positive. It's a huge amount of work, and that's every day, and then the next day brings a whole new set of assignments. That's a lot. I do believe with time, and I don't, I've talked to healthcare leaders, I don't think there's anyone who has this specific answer you're looking for. It's a very good question, but I don't think, I literally have not met someone who can say this is exactly how it goes. I had this conversation just yesterday with Dr. Varma. I think it's fair to say that the more we can kind of wrap our arms around, squeeze, contain this disease through the contact tracing, that you are right, that should push down the numbers with a challenge of a counter dynamic as more and more people are coming in close contact because of going back to work, even with all the precautions, humans are humans, it's not gonna be perfect. So you will see some spread of disease when people go back to work. Our job is to keep it very contained, and if we see a localized site that needs to be addressed immediately or even shut down immediately to take those actions. But Steve, I don't think we have an exact number. I think if you said, what's the final stage look like where we really have succeeded? It's where there's basically no new cases in New York City, only if one comes from outside New York City, which is a ways off to say the least. That's probably at this point only achievable with a vaccine. So to get to that low transmission phase, I think you're talking certainly, you're, you gotta go through the whole summer into the fall because we're gonna to have to deal with the impact of each new phase, each new reopening and what that does even as we build the contract tracing bigger and bigger and bigger. But look, if we can get there over the next few months, I would consider that a real victory. If we could get to the point that we could literally say we had only a handful of new cases each day that came from New York City, that would be a huge victory, but I can't give you the date yet. It's gonna take some time to see what the reality brings. And of course, to make sure we never see a resurgence, which is the, the clear and present danger I worry about every single day. Thank you very much for that answer, I appreciate it. And then uh, the other question concerns uh, the phase one of the reopening yesterday. 
you know, many of the city's most popular retail stores and some of the most popular shopping districts remained covered in plywood because of vandalism and looting that happened well over a week ago and has essentially disappeared. Uh, those stores didn't seem to take advantage of the phase one reopening. What is the city doing to assure the retail sector that it is safe to take down the plywood to do away with a block after block of boarded up storefronts in places like Fulton Mall, where I was out yesterday, and there were barely any stores that op that took advantage of, of the lifting of the restrictions. And 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 what are you doing to support those retailers in keeping those stores, uh, you know, safe right now and, and assured that yes, you don't have to worry anymore that you can that you can reopen, don't have to put the plywood back up. Yeah, Steve, great question as well couple of different points. I, you know, I've been talking to people in the retail sector, starting with the CEO of Macy's, who is absolutely confident uh, in their ability uh, to come back and rare and to go. Um, the reality of curbside pickup or pickup in store is complicated for a lot of retail folks in, in a very, you know, tight urban environment. If you're talking about, you know, suburbs, you're talking about malls, things like curbside pickup are much easier, but in a lot of parts of New York City, it's not the easiest thing. Uh, the, the state rules are for the whole state, and, and we're the least car-focused part of New York State. Uh, the in-store is different and doable, but still harder because of distance. So when I talked to uh, the CEO of Macy's, Jeff Gannett, the, you know, they want to get going. They want to figure out how to do all of the above, but most especially they want to get to phase two where they can get closer to normal operations. As he told me, the Herald Square store sustained very little damage, nothing that would stop them from moving forward. And generally, the word I've gotten from folks in the business community is they understand that we saw like a perfect storm uh, over those first few days, and that now, of course, communities all over the city, uh, small business owners, big business owners, uh, NYPD, everyone's on alert for anything that might attempt to reassert in terms of a, attempts to harm people or property. And I really believe we're not going to see anything like that again because that happened in, a, again, a perfect storm moment where a lot of attention was distracted elsewhere. That won't happen now. But uh, I think what's going to happen, Steve, is that a lot of retail folks won't think phase one is what works for them because curbside pickup and in-store pickup just won't be the effective context for them. They want to get to phase two where they can do as much their normal operations as positive, and that's when I think you're going to really see retail come alive in New York City. Next, we have Julia from The Post. Julia? Hey, good morning. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, Julia. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Happy uh, day two of phase one on the city's reopening. Day two, phase uh, one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> moving forward. Um, I'm wondering, Mr. Mayor, my first question, could you please explain to New Yorkers why it took the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis for you to decide to shift funding from the NYPD instead of at any other time during your tenure, including after the death of Eric Garner right here in New York City? Yes, Julia. The fact, um, in the first years of this mayorality, we were not only trying to deal with issues of justice and civil rights, we were trying to deal with issues of crime that were far from resolved. We now look back after six years of driving down crime to the levels not seen since the 1950s and we're able to look at a whole bigger agenda. But I want to be clear that in the beginning of this administration, we were dealing with huge challenges of violence against people who live in public housing. We were seeing a surge in shootings. We were dealing with a crisis between police and community that had been created by stop and frisk. And that crisis needed an answer, and the answer was neighborhood policing. Neighborhood policing actually required more resources. The city council prioritized uh, a couple years into my administration. Their number one priority was more police officers on the street for safety. We added 2,000 more officers on patrol. And we did the things to reform the NYPD while also driving down crime, reducing arrests, reducing incarceration, and we can do a lot more. So that was what we went through. That was what we had to address then. We're at a moment now where we can take this action show people that our young people will be the focus, help uplift them and still keep the city safe. I'm very comfortable we can make that, uh, that goal achievable. Oh, good. You have a second one, Julia. Yeah, I did. And it's actually for the First Lady, if she's still here. Yep, she's coming back from uh, 
the bullpen. Come on. <laughs> Go ahead. She can hear you. Hey, a happy belated uh, wedding anniversary to you, First Lady. Um, and then I'd like to ask you if you urge the mayor to reverse his position on not cutting any funds from the NYPD um, to where he's at now, which is supporting a shift to youth services. And if not, how was that decision made? I will start and pass to the First Lady. The answer is yes. The First Lady and the task force believe that the shift of funds to youth services made sense, and she can tell you about it. Julia, there's no question uh, that it was important to move more funds to youth and social services. Um, we submitted a, a questionnaire to uh, more than 300 residents of the hardest hit communities. We talked to community leaders, um, members of community-based organizations, and that was one of the um, most important uh, responses that we, we got back. You know, mental health was at the top, but um, the, the fact that we need more uh, resources for our young people was right up there. Um, there was no question that that was uh, something that, that needed to be addressed. And I, you know, even without those responses, uh, I, I talked, to the, talked to my husband about it and en encouraged him to uh, find, help, help us find ways to, to do that because uh, I, you know it's something I know from my heart. If young people don't have uh, constructive activities uh, during the summer, I mean even better to have paid uh, internships, have mentorships, uh, then then they, they, you know they're going to do something, and uh, not necessarily anything bad, but um, it's it's a setback. Any you know middle class family, any upper class family. You know, they all have activities for their children. They travel. They do. They there are so many positive outlets for that energy uh, that young people have. Um, but in these communities, the opportunities are lacking. And they've been lacking, and we have to do everything we can to address that gap. Okay, who's next? Last two for today. Uh, next, we have Marsha from CBS. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to follow up on, on the question that I asked you yesterday about where you're going to find money for police cuts. The city controller has suggested that one way you could find that money would be a hiring freeze in the NYPD, which would save $245 million a year, and over the course of the next year and a half would reduce the size of the police force to 35000 which is the same amount that... Um, was enforced from 2011 to 2016. Do you think that's something that you might look at as a possibility for uh, cutbacks? Marcia, there's going to be a real dialogue with the city council. As I said, I'm speaking again with the Black Latino Asian Caucus of the council this week. Uh, a real dialogue about what makes sense to do in terms of shifting money from the NYPD to youth services and social services. There's also going to be a real dialogue about how we make sure we keep our, our communities safe. I have had the honor of getting to know communities all over this city, and when I talk to city council members about their neighborhoods, they consistently emphasize to me the concerns of everyday people, whether they're you know, working class people, middle class people, lower income people, union members, store owners, homeowners, renters, that talk to me about the real lives of real people. When I was in uh, Cambria Heights on Saturday, people came in and talked about what they're going through, not only their concerns about justice and better dynamics between police and community, but also what's happening. They don't have paychecks. They don't know how to pay the rent. They're, they're concerned about how to overcome the challenge of this moment, and they're always concerned about safety. And so we will figure out how to strike that balance working with the council. I want to make sure whatever we do ensures the ability to keep all neighborhoods safe, including some neighborhoods that still have never known the safety they deserve. We talked about some precincts in this a city that are still dealing with way too much violence, and we've got to find the right way to address that. So I, I'm not going to answer you about one specific approach or another. That's going to be the subject of dialogue, but I'm going to give you the, the clear frame that I feel, which is we can find money 
out of the NYPD to go to youth services and social services, but we have to protect safety on the ground. That is exactly why this same city council just a few years ago wanted more officers in neighborhoods with a neighborhood policing mentality to build a different approach, to build relationships. So we'll figure out how to do that uh, under obviously very adverse uh, budget circumstances in general, but that's the balance we're gonna strike. Mr. Mayor, my follow-up question is this. So are you saying that you don't wanna to touch patrol strength especially in these times where the NYPD is seeing a spike in crime? Marsha, I'm very concerned about that spike in crime. I don't, I, look, I don't know what's going to hit New York City next, if it's going to be locusts or what it's going to be, but, you know, there's something feeling a little biblical nowadays. We have the, the greatest health care crisis in the history of this city. We have uh, the, an economic crisis only comparable to the Great Depression. We have a, a moment of profound pain and a cry for justice that must be addressed. And we have profound safety challenges that after years of beating back crime, we have seen in the last weeks some very troubling indicators of crime rising. And it's rising in the same communities often that are the hardest hit by the coronavirus and the economic crisis. So we cannot uh, allow people to, on top of everything else, not feel safe We've got to figure out what that balance is. We're going to have the conversation with the NYPD. How do we keep people safe? We're going to have the, council, the conversation with the council. What's the right things to take out of the NYPD uh, that makes sense so we can fund these other initiatives? And we're going to do it against the backdrop of the biggest fiscal crisis since the 1970s. So somehow we're going to strike that balance. But I, I will only keep it broad, Marsha, on purpose because this is subject of discussion and negotiation and a lot of thinking we all have to do together. Whatever we do, we must keep the city safe. Last question for today, Luis from New York Old. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Luis, how you doing? I've got a question. Hey, how are you doing? Good. I've got a question for Mr. Phil Thompson. It's my understanding that you're leading the Faith-Based Advisory Council. Uh, there's no question how faith plays an important part in the lives of most New Yorkers. And considering how New York City's places of worship might be able to partially open after phase two. I was hoping you could enlighten us as to the purpose of the council and any progress made thus far. I'll start and pass to Phil. Phil and a lot of others have been deeply involved in our faith efforts. Our commissioner for community affairs, uh, Marco Carrion, uh, has been a key leader in the effort, the head of our uh, community and faith initiatives, Reverend uh, Dominique Atchison. Um, and then, of course, the faith leaders. Uh, for so long, we've had extraordinary leadership from Pastor Michael Walren, First Corinthian uh, Baptist in Harlem. Uh, we've had tremendous leadership from Coral, led by Cardinal Dolan and so many others. Um, so the voices of faith communities are constant in this administration. We listen constantly. It's been crucial to the Thrive Initiative with the faith efforts to spread mental health support through congregations. Uh, I've had a number of calls with faith leaders over the last few weeks, and they have been incredible in helping people through this crisis, including telling people that it wasn't time to come back to services. So now we have an opportunity to start services on a more modest level in phase two, and then build from there, but always making sure we're continuing to hold back this disease. So a lot of good work is happening. And then when there's specific suggestions, there's been suggestions about how to start restart services. That certainly contributed to the thinking of the city and the state. Um, there's been suggestions both ways, including us asking faith leaders to take the lead and helping people understand how to be safe. But we will be engaging faith leaders constantly on what they think will be additional steps we need to take for justice in communities and to serve communities' needs. And Phil, I know you have worked with a lot of faith leaders over the years. Uh, so if you have other reflections you'd like to offer on how we're going to work with them and some uh, specific things that might come of that, I'd appreciate it. And obviously you've been particularly focused because you have Department of Youth Services under you on the, the question of how we can serve youth, which is a central, central concern for faith leaders as well. Phil Thompson. Thank you. Um, I would just mention three of the uh, items we've been talking about on the Faith Council, and um, I will tell you that the conversations have been so robust that um, 
we've decided to keep meeting for weeks longer than originally planned just so we can uh, keep the dialogue going because so many things have come up. But uh, one big concern of the faith leaders actually was that the entire faith community um, follow safe practices and not open up too quickly or unsafely. And that was a concern that the faith leaders themselves really emphasized. Um, two initiatives uh, we discussed last week. Uh, one, several of the leaders that have large uh, churches, synagogues, and buildings, um, such as the um, Archdiocese in Brooklyn, want to open up their buildings for storefront churches, smaller churches that don't have the kind of ventilation or room for spacing people out. Um, they want to open up their doors to invite those churches to use their facilities so that they could have staggered hours for church services, things like that. And so that was something um, they were very interested in, the large churches, and we're following up on how to make that happen. A second thing, many of the uh, churches and synagogues said they would like that are predominantly white said they would like to invite um, people from the protest movements, Black Lives Matter, others to come and talk to their congregations about what they've been experiencing, what their aspirations are, so there could be more understanding across communities about all of this and how we can all work together to achieve a more just and fair city. And that is something um, actually, we're all very excited about, and we're going to continue those conversations and figure out how to operationalize a lot of that. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That Go ahead, Luis. Thank you, sir. That all sounds very promising. Uh, my next question is for you, Mr. Mayor. I traveled through the subways yesterday, and I made sure I passed through major stations like Times Square and Grand Central. Admittedly, there were barely any commuters. However, I didn't see the slightest bit of public awareness signage. There were social distancing markings only on a couple of station platforms and only one single platform controller, understandably so. Uh, would I be correct in thinking that this will ramp up as we go forward in time? Yeah, look, this is, we have continued to work productively with the MTA, but I wanna push them to do more and more and more. I believe the markings are crucial. This is an area we still haven't resolved. I believe it would be really helpful to have markings on every platform. Look, look, uh, folks who own grocery stores, supermarkets, they put markings outside to show people where to stand in line. Like, it's just so helpful. People make sense of things when they see the markings. In my view, every platform, uh, every metro car machine, every uh, uh, subway car, every bus should have markings to show people if you sit here or you stand here, then here's the next place someone should be sitting or standing. I understand, I do feel sympathy. The MTA is trying to move a lot of people and they're saying they're not sure that's realistic and I appreciate why they say it. I think we have a chicken and egg problem here at Luis. I think if they would put down the markings, more and more people would come back and be comfortable on the subways because it would give a sense of order. So I, I would just urge the MTA to try it, try doing it more and more, see if it works. If it works, it might be a really great thing. If it doesn't work, I'll be the first to say it was worth trying, but it didn't work. So I would like to see that. On the signage, absolutely, that's, uh, that should be the one thing we all agree. The MTA needs to step up on that. The signage is obvious. People need that. It helps them. And on the personnel, we are going to work with them on that. We're providing personnel to help them. They should maximize the use of their own personnel uh, creatively. I think we can work together and, and make this work. But I do think a human directive presence, Luis, helps. It helps people to think about what they need to do. I mean, we're, we're human beings. If someone's there who says, hey, here's a good way to address, you know, to, to deal with this situation. Why don't you stand here? Why don't you stand there? Or that car's too full. Go on the one behind it. People respond to that. Um, so, and again, I want it, that's, that's all about education. That's not about enforcement. That's not about summonses. That's not about the NYPD. We took the NYPD out of that. It is about education and helping people see uh, the right way to do things. So look, everyone, uh, I'll conclude by saying, 
we are dealing with some of the biggest challenges in the history of the city right now, maybe the single most difficult moment in the history of New York City. But I stand up here every day with faith, and I'll tell you why, because I know the people of the city. I just do, I know all of you. I don't know all of you personally, but I know the character and the heart and soul of the people of this city. I've spent a lifetime watching and listening and engaging and seeing the strength of this place. We will overcome everything that's been thrown at us. A few weeks ago, we didn't think the challenges of these last few weeks were coming. That happened. We will deal with this. We will deal with whatever's next and whatever's next and whatever's next. But we have to deal with it from a perspective of justice. We have to deal with it from a perspective of fairness. That's actually how you move forward, recognizing what was wrong and doing something about it. And I have faith we can do so much more. I really do. So for the next year and a half, you're going to see a lot of things change. You will see a recovery, and you will see fairness pervade that recovery. And then it'll be a better city to move forward into a future. And again, if you meet a person who says New York City can't come back, won't come back, can't overcome its problems, that person doesn't understand the people in New York City. Tell them they're wrong. Tell them that we're going to show them how far we can reach together. Thank you.